My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, today we got a freaking A-lister from across the pond hanging out with us, man. And we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, you and I, we got into comics because of uh, drawing. We wanted to grow up to draw comics. That was a sexy gig. Uh, so we've been sort of thin on writer conversations. I like to talk to the prettiest girl in the room when I go to a party. Why not start at the tippity top, man? Mark Miller, thanks for joining us. I'm delighted to the prettiest girl. I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, rattle off some titles, man, before we, we get busy. Oh, man. There's almost a before and after, before Miller World, of course, which we know of as Wanted Kick-Ass. Um, before that, Superman, Ultimates, which goes on to influence so much of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've heard Civil of it. War, Old Man Logan. Jupiter's Legacy, one of my favorites, uh, with Frank Quitely. So the list goes on and on. We'd be here all day if we were just going through the list of books that, that Mark has written. Um, but chances are, everybody who's watching this knows some of his work. Hey, Mark, here, here's a question, Ben. Are, are Jim and I idiots because we elected to draw our comics that we also write, man? Well, no, every writer is a failed artist. Like, I'm a failed artist. Like, I really wanted to draw comics. Like, no kid ever sits down and thinks, I'm going to write a script. You know, when you're five, you don't get the pens and the paper and the coloring stuff and everything. You don't think, I'm going to write the best damn 36 page script ever. You know, you're like, I'm going to do the best drawing of Batman or I'm going to do the best drawing of Superman. So as a kid, I just wanted to be a comic book artist. And, um, and there's actually, a, I don't know if I've ever told this story, but I accidentally became a writer when I was 18. And I heard that, you know who Dick Giordano is? You know, like he used to run DC back in the 80s. Now, this is what I love about you guys, actually. I'm so used to doing mainstream interviews that I have to say, do you know who Dick Giordano is? The yeah. audience can but, keep but, up too, man. So so uh, don't don't feel the need to, uh, you know, like add those little preambles, man. They'll keep up. This is, this is what I love about KFM. Yeah. But like, um, but Dick Giordano was coming to London and this was really exciting. I was a teenager. I was just at high school. And he was looking for artists and he was going along to, to this place called the Society of Strip Illustrators in London. So I went down with a couple of pals and sort of blagged my way in. I wasn't a member or anything. And I remember having my portfolio, my art portfolio with me. And I was like, I'm going to be drawn Batman. I'm going to be working at DC. This is awesome. And I was standing in a line and it was, it was kind of like a, a meat market. You know, there was like a hundred guys, you know, with their portfolios under their arms. Mark, the guy Mark real quick, can, can I ask, is this like the fateful time Dick Giordano comes there and like gets Alan Moore for the first time? Is it oh like my God, no, 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 no. That was years before, you know, he was, he was onto the dregs by the time of the day. <laughs> this is maybe, I was 18, so maybe 1988 or something, a okay. little bit later. Okay. So I'm, I'm just like desperate to work in comics, you know, coming out of high school, nothing I want for in the world. And I remember just having this folder and I was so proud of it, you know, because I was like the best artist in my class, which is a bit different from being a, on a global stage, you know. So I remember having my little folder and the guy in front of me was a guy called David Hine, who I'm now friends with, you know. But Dave, Dave actually had a, like a leather bound case and it had a zip. And I had a little paper folder that mine was in, and all of my uh, all of my artwork was drawn on square maths paper with you know like a, a cheap pen, and all of his stuff was beautifully inked and all laid out. And I looked at everyone else, and I thought, oh my god, these guys are like adults, you know. And I was so embarrassed by my, my and I'd drawn the Green Lantern flying out towards you and everything, and, and it just looked like a child, you know. And I remember just closing my thing up and thinking, right, I have to do something else, you know. And I'd, I'd, I'd dabbled in writing a little bit. I'd sent proposals into DC when I was 12 and 13 and everything, but I was, I was, I said I would do anything. Like I was just willing to work in comics in any capacity. And, um, and then when I got to Giordano, I'd formulated a pitch for a creeper story. So I just gave him my idea for a creeper story. And it started a little bit of a relationship with DC Comics. But I, like, like all writers, I'm a failed artist. There are two Mark Miller stories uh, that, that I know uh, that I've sort of heard firsthand. One is the famous Dave Gibbons story where Dave is doing signings for, for Watchmen and a teenage Mark Miller comes up, perhaps around the same age as the kid who uh, visited yeah. Dick Giordano and uh, basically told Dave, listen, man, I know, I know what the next comic is you need to write. I'm writing, <laughs> I'm working on the script for it right now. So that's like <laughs> the one story. Other story, Jim, you and I, we were on some travels. I'm not going to name the guy's name just because finances are involved, but, but Homeboy hung out with us, sat with us and said, yeah, Mark approached me this one time and said, blankety blank, I just want to make you a millionaire. <laughs> dot, 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 ellipsis. And he did. <laughs> Mark, that's, we, in the city here, I'm going to teach you some Pittsburgh slang, man. We call that, we call that big dick energy, man. Like you got the 50 pound nuts. That's awesome. 
Well, that, that was why whenever I would consult an artist for Miller World, you know, the, the first couple of things did well, you know, like once it was the first book became a movie, third book was Kick-Ass, became a movie and everything, you know, and brought a lot of money in for the creative team. And I just thought, my pitch to artists, and this is why I always got the best guys, as I would always contact them. And I've got such an eye for artists, right? I mean, we're all comic fans. We know the good from the bad, right? So I would always go for the best guys. And I would say, listen, you can work for Marvel and DC and be a thousand there, or you can come and work with me and become a millionaire, you know? And I, I used, that was my pitch to them. And they would be like, okay, let's do it. You know, and they all did, you know, every, every millionaire. Okay. 50 pound nuts. <laughs> Mark, we uh, we talked to a lot of artists about collaboration. And so, you know, you mentioned picking some of the best artists to work with. Are there certain things that you look for in an artist? Do you look for specific artists for specific ideas? Like, do you write to artists the way, you know, a screenwriter might write to, for an actor? That's a really interesting question because for me, the artist is the most important part of the equation. It always is. And, and any writer that says otherwise is a liar. A big book, you know, always as an artist behind it really you know there's a few exceptions but generally art sells your book and the, if you work with a big artist you will sell more than if you're working with a lesser uh, well-known artist you know um but i tend to actually just take a project at a time you know so like i'll, I'll have a project i want to write a comic that i want to do that i'm in love with and I, I just think, who's the best possible guy for this? A bit like casting a movie, you know, so you've come up with James Bond and you think, okay, I'm looking at James Mason, I'm looking at David Nevin, I'm looking at Sean Connery, I'll go for Sean Connery, you know? So it's like, who, who's appropriate to the project that you're working on? Like Starlight's a very good example. Like I had this idea for an old man Flash Gordon type project, you know? And I, uh, I thought, who'd be good for that? And I didn't want to do something too American. For some reason, I, I knew it had to be European and I wanted it to have a Mobius kind of feel to it. And I was thinking, well, what's, what's like Mobius, but not a swipe of Mobius? It feels like its own thing. So it, it just Goran seemed like a perfect choice. Goran Parlov, nobody except Goran could have drawn that as beautifully as he did. And who knew that he had a great sci-fi project in him? But I just instinctively knew he was the man. As soon as I started looking through his stuff and my tea break, you know, Google Imaging, his stuff and looking through sketches he'd done, I was like, this is the guy, it's, it's him. And I think nine times out of 10, I think I tend to choose the right guy, you know? Sometimes I've, I've, I've worked with people who are brilliant artists, but they're maybe not ideal for the project. I think generally um, we've, we've synced really well. And I think the trick is to always work with somebody more talented than you are, you know? So I've always sought out the guys who are my heroes, you know, and, and, and tried to work with them. Are you pretty rigid when it comes to what you want from, from the artist? Like if we, uh, you know, we go down the line and we start to accumulate lots of these interviews, we start to talk to some of your collaborators, are they going to be like, Mark Miller, man, he's a tough customer. <laughs> well, it's, I, I always think I'm really easy. And then the artists, well, maybe five of them are in the bar with me or something like that. And they'll be like, oh man, your scripts are like the hardest ever. <laughs> and, I, and then they all agree and I'm like, well, they, if, it's like, if there's a group of them saying this, they must be correct. You know, it must be true. I, I'm obviously wrong, you know. But, like, I, what I'll do is I'll say to them, and when I look back through the scripts ever since they pointed this out, I can't unsee this now. But I always say, turn the page to the greatest splash page in the history of mankind and everything. You know? So I'll always, like, set the bar really high and say, right, you know, make this the best thing you've ever drawn. And then four pages later, panel four, I'll be like, make this the best thing you've ever tried, you know? So like, I'm always uh, trying to get the best out of them, but it's only because I'm so into it, you know? And I think it's kind of contagious because it does tend to bring out the best work in these guys. I mean, I've been really lucky. Like when I was working with each artist, it feels like, you know, the, the best I've ever seen them do. Like uh, there's, I've never got pages back really disappointed. I've actually always been delighted. You're right. It's probably up to them to answer that question. Frank Whiteley, JRJR, <laughs> get in touch. Let's get in touch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but Frank Quitely, I mean, you know, he he's, lives nearby, you know, he's a friend of mine in Scotland as well. And he says, I hate doing your stuff. You know, it's just, it's like so hard, you know, because everybody else balances it out with maybe four pages of action and then a six page talking head scene or something. And it just makes his life worth living, you know. Whereas for me, it's just relentless. If this was a movie, it would cost $600 million. <laughs> it would be impossible. You know? Another piece of the uh, the collaborative puzzle is like an editor and also publisher. And, you know, you've published with virtually everyone. I wonder uh, how you think about editors and publishers, if you have an editor you trust, or if that's something, well, you tell me. That's a really good question. Like, um, 
there's lots of different types of editors. I mean, I, I've worked in the industry a long time now, you know, I mean, three decades. I was 19 when I started, um, 19 pretty much full time from then. And, uh, and I've worked with all different types of editors. There's the authoritarian, strict authoritarian editor who will play games with you, which is horrible, you know, like you don't really hear much about this, but, but this is a culture that used to exist within comics. And when you're at a certain level in your career, it can be soul destroying, you know, I mean, I've, I, I've been there, you know, I, I was that guy in my twenties and uh, not all of them. I mean, I had some wonderful guys I worked with as well, but there was guys who would literally just mess with you, you know, just cause they were bored, you know, like, um, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I wrote a script for something one time, the editor, um, you know, I did a good job. You know, you can tell you've done a good one. And I'd written a load of rubbish around about it, but this was like one, one good script. And this editor said to me, uh, that's a really good script you've done. I'm really delighted. And I was like, that's great, thanks. I'm happy with it. And he says, there's just one point. And I was like, uh, what is it? And he says, this story thing doesn't really make sense, this thing on page 18 or something. And I was like, oh, no, no, it refers to this thing on page four. And he was like, oh, right, okay. And then he was so annoyed that I'd sort of, told him something he'd missed that I'd never encountered this before that he said actually I think this script's terrible the whole thing's a mess he said I'm going to rewrite this he said I'll get back to you and then like three months passed and I didn't hear anything from him right oh my god and like every penny counted I mean I was living check to check to check at the time it was a nightmare so I was desperate for any backup strip or anything that came along and then but this was in fax times you know before email and everything you know I got a fax of the issue through and it had been drawn exactly as I described, but every word of dialogue had been redialogued, and it was like a total mess. And it didn't even make sense. And the guy had just done it as an exercise in control. So I then went on the phone, and I remember at the time I was so conscious, I put a clock in front of me, so conscious of the cash, that I put a clock in front of me because it was really expensive to call America from Scotland. And I, I went through, and it took three hours to untangle this guy's rewrite back to where I was, you know? So there's that type of editor, which is like a nightmare, you know? Then there's the guys who make stupid suggestions, but are generally okay, you know? Then there's the guys who are really good, who are brilliant, you know? And and then there's the ones who don't really do much at all. And and as you go through your career, you know, the sort of, as, as you hit a certain point when your book's selling really well, they tend to lay off you. And I think I generally work best in that environment because I'm quite tough on myself. I'm not the sort of guy that hands in a first draft, you know, like I, I'll spend two weeks on average in a comic script. If you look back over my career, I write about 18 or 19 comics a year. It looks like a lot I'm doing, but it's actually not. You know, I, I rarely have two books out a month. You know, it's always just under two a month. And um, and I think by the time I've handed it in, I, I've memorized the script. Like I know it so well, I've shaved it down, I've chopped scenes, clipped a panel here, combined panels. I've, I've got it pretty tight by that point. So editors, really since I was about 30, you know, ever since about 1999, 2000s, I've been sort of left to my own devices, which is great. But prior to that, it was it was quite hard. Some exceptions, though, I mean, a guy like Archie Goodwin um, bought my first ever DC script. And I remember having lunch with him. He came to Glasgow, like, believe it or not, DC used to come over to Glasgow, which seems incredible now, you know, but there was just so much money at the company. I think in the old days, they would send everybody in these jollies all over Europe and everything, you know? So all the editors used to have a great time in Paris and they'd do London and come up to Glasgow for no reason except to come out for a drink for five days and everything. And I was maybe 21 at the time, 22, and actually Goodwin was coming to Glasgow and I was like, oh my God, you know, so I contacted him and arranged to meet him for lunch because I'd had a couple of things in 2008 time. And, uh, and I sat with him and I think I learned more in that 90 minutes over lunch than like the rest of my career, you know, because it was, the guy was a master at what he did. And I had this Batman story that he really liked and he made a couple of suggestions. And you know, when somebody just hits the chisel in exactly the right place and he was like, that'll make your story better. And I was like, you're 150% right, that's great, you know? So, I mean, but guys like that is so rare. I mean, the old system used to be really good where you would be a writer and then once you'd learned your craft, you had a paid salary job as an editor. And I kind of missed that a little bit, you know, like back in the 60s and the 70s, the editors knew the, the ropes. A lot of them had been around the industry 20, 30 years. They'd been writers or artists themselves. And I think it brought something something to it. But there's still, there's a lot of good editors out there, though. I mean, don't get me wrong. Can we ask some craft stuff? Because uh, we have been pretty artist driven here. And uh, Jim and I, you know, we got into the game with with art in mind uh so for myself personally i'm trying to catch up as a writer and mm -hmm. i've been uh absorbing so many books and master classes and uh one 
one thing where there seems to be this like line of demarcation uh, when it comes to like designing uh, characters. Some mm-hmm. writers, guys like uh, for film usually, David Mamet, Aaron Sorkin, they say that uh, it's just magical thinking if you kind of create a backstory for your characters and try to flesh them out before you get started with the actual script. Uh, yeah. Guys like uh, Neil Gaiman, Alan Moore, at least the Alan Moore that wrote that 1986 set of essays, like right before uh, Watchmen, he mm-hmm. goes as far as like acting out, you know, the character's life in front of a mirror. You know, maybe that's kayfabe or not. <laughs> but uh, so so we have we have two people who say that that's a waste of time. We have two people, comics related guys, who say that there's value in that. Um, how, yeah. What's your approach to designing characters? I start everything with a drawing because it's a, it's a visual medium, you know, so, and, and like I say, because I draw anyway, you know, like, I'll give you an example, Old Man Logan's a good example, when I was doing Wolverine, I, I, I was doodling and just, I'll sometimes spend two, three days between projects just doodling, I'll just sit and draw, and I'll draw 200 pages, you know, I'll just sit and do mad sketches of anything, you know, and then amongst it all, I'll find something kind of interesting, and I, in the corner of a page, I drew this little picture of Wolverine with grey hair, just with, with completely gray hair and just looking old and looking tired. And then I, I drew like, you know, it's farm stuff around him and everything. And I, I drew I no claws and I drew him with, with a farm around. I was like, this is kind of interesting. Wolverine's an old man. He's living on a farm now. He hasn't popped his claws in a long time and everything. And the story grew organically from there. You know, that unforgiven sort of take of a guy who was the man with no name in the past, which is what Wolverine emerged from really, you know, um, you know, and becoming, a legend and then a myth and then forgotten you know and that just seemed really interesting to me and i thought okay how did it end up in that situation so i grew the stories organically from there and uh i i started to really sort of flesh flesh him out like where, where he had been at that point kick-ass was the same kick-ass started with a drawing i had of somebody in a superhero costume trying it for the first time and getting stabbed on his first night before he even threw his first punch he stabbed and then some other guy hits him and then he gets run over by a car and I did that drawing, and then I was thinking, okay, who is this kid then, you know? And I was thinking, well, if you like superheroes so much, he must be a comic book fan if he's dressing up as superheroes, you know, he's a cosplayer, really, you know? And he's actually got a sort of intrinsic moral sort of decency in there as well, because he's actually wanting to go out and look after his neighborhood. You know, is he lonely? Is he maybe somebody who is isolated, you know? Has he lost somebody in his family? So, so the whole sort of character started to emerge of his mom had died and all this kind of stuff, you know? So I'll sit and plan that stuff for weeks before I start writing something. When I was doing Jupiter's Legacy, I worked out the mythology of all the characters for two months and I'd post-it notes all over my room. And the thing that was really annoying actually is Frank Whiteley was at a party in my house and he rearranged all my notes at the party <laughs> and came into the room. And I said to him, like, this is so important and I'm making sure the kids don't touch this. And then he got in and changed it all and he wrote like really horrible notes and everything and put them up in amongst my notes. You know? And like, uh, but I, I worked out the backstories, I worked out who their parents were, everything. And it didn't even make it into the story, but I knew who they were. I knew what their favorite food was. I knew what newspaper this guy read. I knew what music this guy was listening to in 1929. I knew everything about the characters. So much so actually that the companion series then seemed inevitable because I only ever planned to do Jupiter's Legacy. But the prequel series, which has turned out massively important in the television show, I mean, that's half the television show. Um, the, the, the prequel series was really easy to write because everybody's backstory was there. So it, re- really, it can be really rewarding and really fun, actually. I, I love fleshing all that. And the idea of just jumping in there and, you know, making them cypher, ciphers or something, it just it doesn't seem that appealing to me. You know, I like to know who they are. They've got to be 3D. What's the next step, Mark, after you, you're getting in this planning process? Are you writing directly to script? Are you breaking down story? Um you know, we, we hear about writers doing it on index cards. There's obviously yeah. people work from outlines as opposed to uh, seat of your pants. I'd say it changed actually when I started working in film. Um, up until up until then, I used to do seat of the pants, and I really revolutionised the way I wrote once I, I started uh, working in film because what happened was uh, I'd maybe have a three part story, and part one would work out good, part two would work out good. And I only had a tiny amount of space to do part three, but the artist was already drawn to an issue one had been lettered. And, I was like, oh. and then I'd go back and try and fix it and I'd beg them to redraw a panel or something. And I realized this is a horrible way of working. You know? and, and I think my life completely changed once I started working in film. And I thought, 
I should treat everything like an actual story with a beginning, middle, and end. And I quite like the way Frank Miller does it, you know, but he just goes in and tells a story. I, I, I kind of hate things that go on for 100 issues and everything, you know, like I see the value in it, but it's just not for me, you know, and I know there's fallow patches and everything. I, I love the way Miller just comes in like an assassin. He comes in, tells the story and gets the hell out of Dodge, you know, and he's giving you the best Batman story in four issues you've ever read in your life, you know. And I, I was growing up, I loved that, and I've always been really inspired by that. Um, and I just think from the reader's point of view, it's good too, isn't it? So it's something with no fat on it, you know? So, so I've started approaching my stories maybe the last 10, 15 years like that too, where what I do is I, I figure out the ending first, actually. You know, so I've, I've done all the drawing, I've done all my designs, all the things I'm thinking of that the artist will improve upon. Um, but then what I do is I, um, I sit and block it out and I plan the story meticulously, you know, so that I can actually verbally say it out loud from beginning to end. And I don't even need to say it to anyone, but just so that I could say it to myself and I run through the whole thing. And I can see it then in front of me and I know the beats and I know that this needs picked up a little here, this needs shaped a little here. The ending is smaller than the beginning, so I need to you know, do something to enlarge the ending and make the ending feel as if there's a sense of escalation running through the story. So I, I treat it like, it's like a sculpture. You know, I, I have the whole thing there in front of me. And once I'm really confident with it, then I go and I sit with my wife, who's a really, really excellent editor, you know, and not in the comic book sense, but in the sense she'll be honest, you know, and if something makes sense, no, not even so much do you like this idea because she's not necessarily into the stuff I'm into, you know, in terms of comic books, but it's like, does this make any sense? Does this seem out of character for this character? And to her eternal credit, she'll sit there for like an hour and a half or something. Well, I say, okay, right, so it starts like this and I'll run through the whole thing. And then you can see her sort of thinking and she'll be like, mm, I feel that's a little too much. And then I'll, I'll rein it back in a little bit. And then once I have something that I'm really happy with, then I start typing. And that can be weeks. And I, I deliver six issues at once to the artist. So the artist gets all six scripts and it's in stone by that point. You know, it's like, I, I know there's nothing I can change. It's as good as I can possibly get. One of the common things that come up in all the discussions that I read about uh, the, the craft of writing, it seems that there, that most writers agree that at the moment when you're constructing a narrative, uh, inevitably there's a moment where you get stuck or as we say, you know, you, uh, you write yourself into a corner. They all say that that is great because this is, uh, if you can't figure out how to get out of it, the reader can't figure out how to get out of it either. So now this is where the real writer comes in and solves the problem. Can you, can you speak to that in any of your uh, works specifically? I think that's how it worked certainly in the first 10 years of my career. But what I learned to do was to reverse engineer. And I thought I invented this. And then I found out that loads of people do this. You know, like Stephen Moffat, who writes Doctor Who works this way and Alan Moore works this way as well. But what I would do is work out my ending. So I would work out my solution before I created the problem. And it makes you look like a genius, you know, because people think, oh, he's so clever, he tied everything up. But it's like, no, no, no. It was already, it's a magician's trick. You know, like I've got it all worked out. Everything's fine. And then you create jeopardy at the beginning of your story. But in reality, you know exactly where it's going. You know the path. And it's like, it's like a qualification. If you think about it, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something, you pick the relevant degree that takes you to that place. I think it, it, it does as good to know our destination at the beginning of a story. I think the reader doesn't know it, you can disguise it. But I think we ultimately want to know where we're going to end up, I think, with the story. So I love that and I love hiding it and I love taking the reader down little avenues and everything. But I always know where I'm going at, at the, the end. And it looks great. Whenever everything all comes together, you're like, oh, and I'll tell you, here's the most valuable thing that I've discovered over the years, is that quite often when you work in comics, when you've got a finite number of pages and a certain amount of space, it's not like film. <clears throat> it's a bit more like a song or like TV where it's, it's clipped. You know, it's got to be in a very specific amount of time. Is that you, you can end up rushing your story if you've only got one more issue to wrap everything up in. But if you do your ending first and then work your way back, your endings are never rushed, your endings are perfect. And if you need to clip any space, clip the beginning. Because nobody ever moans about a beginning that went on too quickly. You know, nobody's, oh, that beginning is just way too rushed. But they do complain about endings that are too rushed. So use space at the end and have the bare bones at the beginning, just, just what you need to draw people into the story. Mark, you mentioned film uh, and your experience in film. Mm -hmm. Thinking about talking to you uh, I find your work very cinematic, which in comics, sometimes that's a virtue and sometimes it's not, depending on your point of view. Um, 
I'm curious when that in, enters your work. You know, like I think of authority as as being known as like you know widescreen comics, and I guess this would have been about 20 years ago at this point. But I, I don't know if can you talk a little bit about the influence of film on your work in terms of a certain type of storytelling, um, maybe in scale, maybe in archetypes. Does that make sense? Do you know it's funny? A lot of people say that to me, but that film is such a broad thing, isn't it? You know, like film is like an obscure Czechoslovakian poetry movie or something like that, you know, but it's also Michael Bay, you know, it's like films ain't everything in the same way that comics is everything, you know? So, I mean, I think what people mean when they say that sometimes is blockbuster, you know, something that's got a lot of explosions and a big third act set piece and everything, you know, but that's just the way I've always worked. You know, it's like Alex Ross has got a very cinematic style, you know, mainstream people can really understand Alex Ross's work. When I show my, I, I love doing experiments, you know, and I'll, I'll put loads of comics out in front of all sorts of people, you know? And the, the stuff that kids respond to is Rob Liefeld, like kids adore, I mean, kids in 1995, kids in 2005, 2015, the kids in my family all love Rob Liefeld. It's timeless, you know? And adults, you know, like hardcore comic fans will rat, rag on him, you know? But he absolutely speaks to young teens and, and kids, they love the energy. Um, Alex, you show Alex the stuff to sort of mainstream adult audience and they think it's the best thing they've ever seen in their life, you know, because it's pure Americana and they can just totally get all the points of reference, you know. And I think my writing's maybe on some level a little like that, that it's quite easy to understand. It's, it's quite filmic in the sense that, you know, one panel follows the other, you know, it's like it's, it's a four panel page, usually it's on a kind of grid uh, and nobody's confused. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a film, it rolls a little like a movie. The language of comics, can be very sophisticated and especially in non-comics people. Um, I, I think if you're a, a writer artist, that's easy, but I think if you're a writer, it's really hard to describe to an artist what you want to pull off. You know, like uh, if, if you're if you're Frank Miller or Bernie Crickstein or something like that, you know, you can play around with this stuff and you, you know, it, it's, it's all you, isn't it? But if you're a writer, I think to make it clear for the artist, I think I've, I've tended to veer towards making it as simple as possible and put the energy and the, the unusual ideas into what's in the panels themselves, you know, the actual layout of the book, I try to make as, as easy as possible. So I think that make, can make it look a bit like film storyboards and everything as well. And I, I tend to, you know, tend to go for artists that, that work well within that structure too. So it looks less like a, an indie book and it looks a little bit more like a big Marvel summer event or something, you know, the, the type of stuff I tend to do. Uh, did you just mention Frank Miller or Bernie Krigstein? Mm. Was, was that your second reference there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when did you come across Bernie Kriegstein work? Was that something you encountered as a kid in EC reprints? Or he's one of my favorite artists. So to hear those two in a sentence kind of makes sense, but we don't hear it very often. So tell me about you, Bernie Kriegstein. I mean, you can see Kriegstein's influence in Miller completely. You know, like um, I actually discovered uh, Kriegstein when I was about 12 or 13. And what it was was, uh, you know, when you're just becoming obsessed with comics, you know, <laughs> you're reading everything. There was a uh, I don't know if you got it in the States, called The Daredevils. Have you ever heard of The Daredevils? It was a black and white UK magazine from Marvel, Marvel UK. Heard of it, but it's, yeah, it was never here. It was a kind of companion to Warrior. Um, so, so the guys who were doing Warrior were also the guys doing Daredevil. So you, you had um, like Alan Moore and Alan Davis doing Marvel Man, Miracle Man, you know, and then uh, in the Marvel UK Daredevils, they were doing Captain Britain, which has been collected. I'm sure you guys have read it. Um, but Alan Moore, I mean, this this is gold. You should check this out, by the way. You should check it out. Because Alan Moore wrote essays in it, like, every month. So he would write, like, two or three essays in a short story. He would do a, a Night Raven pulp short story or something, you know, um, at the same time as doing an essay on Bernie Krigstein, a four-page essay on Bernie Krigstein, or, like, his appreciation of Frank Miller, this new guy who just started working in America, who was kind of a contemporary of Moore's, and seemed to be doing what he was doing with superheroes over in America. So, so my introduction to a lot of stuff that was maybe a little different from Stan Lee and Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby and all the reprints that we were reading in the UK was, was through this magazine. And then I discovered fandom through that, you know, and that led me on to all these other guys. Then I would find the Hernandez brothers, Robert Crumb, all that stuff. So the stuff that they weren't selling in newsagents, my gateway drug was Alan Moore writing these essays in the back of the Daredevil's monthly magazine. It didn't last very long. You know, sometimes quality doesn't sell on the newsstands. And the magazine is, is phenomenal. It's so good. 
but it was aimed for guys like us as opposed to everybody, which is the newsstand to survive in the newsstand, you've got appeal to hundreds of thousands of people, even in a country as small as the UK, back back in those days especially. So the magazine tanked, but it's like gold. I mean, check it out. Everything in it is brilliant. It's so good. I like hearing all those other names you just mentioned as well, man. The crumbs yeah. and the in the Los Bros Hernandez. Uh, it, it it puts my puts my thoughts in a certain direction. And I wonder um what what you would consider to be success. Like is the the financial part of it the the most important and i think i i guess the real question is um guys like the los bros they're clearly not commercially minded like in a lot of ways like they've been just doing their love and rockets thing getting a lot of offers to do all sorts of other stuff you know dc would love to have jaime hernandez draw a wonder woman comic or something like that he's like nah you know he's just doing his thing um is the financial part of it uh, a decision maker for what you choose to uh to, to put out into the world or do you have some like really kind of like artsy fartsy esoteric stuff that you that's like you're waiting for the right time or no i i'm lucky that what i'm interested in tends to be quite commercial you know like i remember um being asked in a very early interview in my 20s you know just when these things would pop up occasionally which was rare back in those days because nobody's that interested in the guy starting out but somebody said to me um i think it was from time out in london what's your top five movies and I was like Jaws, Superman, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost I mean, it was, <laughs> and like one of my friends who was with me said don't say that you know pretend it's like some French film so they think you're smarter than you are and I was like I'm just like myself though you know so I mean this is this is what I love you know so I, I'm, I'm really fortunate that I'm not one of those guys who's doing Spider-Man the whole time thinking oh I want to do something more like Jean-Luc Godard you know it's like I'm, I'm lucky that this is what I love. You know, this is what I really enjoy doing. But I've got an appreciation of everything. I mean, my, my collection is so wide, but you veer towards what you're, you're good at, I guess, you know? So um, for me, I think the bit, I'll try and bring an odd sensibility, I think, to superheroes, even though they're, they're mainstream, like Kick-Ass, for example, opens a bit like a Robert Crumb comic. You know, it's, it's, it's a lame, a lame superhero who has no powers. I mean, if it was drawn by the Hernandez brothers, it would make perfect sense. He's masturbating in the opening scene. You know, uh, you know what's, this isn't Spider-Man immediately. You know, this isn't Spider-Man. There's a, a guy commits suicide in the opening scene and he gets run over by a car at the end of the first issue. It's like, but when John Romita Jr. draws it, it makes it look like a big commercial comic. So I, I guess my sensibilities are a little bit skewed, but I also do revel in the mainstream and I never I never feel ashamed of the mainstream. Like I, I, I do love it. Like my, my heroes like Kirby, Kurt Swan, you know, like uh, Stan Lee and uh, Steve Ditko. These are all guys who did their best work really in the mainstream. And it, it doesn't have to be crass. It doesn't have to be cheap. You know, it can be absolutely beautiful. You know, like my favorite Neil Adams work is like his Lois Lane covers and his Jimmy Olsen covers and everything. You know, like it's, there's nothing cool about that, that stuff or anything, but it's just brilliant. You know, it's, it's perfect. I took this, uh, we took this screenwriting course to just try to, bone up on on our uh our writing skills uh, over uh last summer when we started writing some new some new comics we're working on at this moment and uh one of the tenets that the teachers tried to like beat into our heads was that um every scene should do two or three things at once like if it, if it's not accomplishing several different tasks for the narrative especially you know the lean nature of a television episode or something uh then then it needs to be clipped do you believe in that philosophy and is that something that you employ or do not employ in like say a pamphlet sized uh comic book i don't think you can think like that you know like i i think um it's instinctive everything's from your car you know like i remember weirdly the editor i was telling you about who, who was the authoritarian guy he said to me I've realized the secret of a good comic script. And I was like, what is it? He said, a guy should have to make a decision about two thirds of the way through the story. And I was like, what? And he gave me some examples of good stories that had a guy making a decision about two thirds of the way through the story. He said, well, there you go. There's the building blocks of a great story. And I was like, that applied to those stories. It doesn't necessarily apply to every story, you know? And I, and I think sometimes we can overanalyze when what we should always do is write with our stomach instead of writing with our head. So I think you just, you know when a scene is right. So um, so I don't think it has to do three things at once. I think a scene doing one thing is pretty good. You know, if it can, if it can do one thing that's more, and do one thing well, it's better than, than most scenes. But I, I do think a comic generally, a very simple rule that I think Stan Lee had 
was something should happen between page one and page 24 that moves the story forward. Because I can't think of many examples where that doesn't hold true, but I've sometimes read comics where that doesn't happen. And I'll watch TV shows and you get quite frustrated watching TV shows that it doesn't seem to be moving forward. So I do think there's something in us that we like a beginning to be smaller than an ending. If you feel more satisfied if your journey goes like that. So if the third act is bigger than your first act, you feel good. And it's just a very simple, simple rule. And I think the story moving forward between the beginning and the end in, a, in any kind of serial is, uh, is important. Mark, I'm not sure the best way to ask this question. So I'm just going to be clumsy and, and we'll try to filter our way through it. You strike me as being maybe the most successful uh, cartoonist, you know, writer of comics, somebody coming out of the, the Marvel DC mold. Um, possibly the most successful of all time. I wonder if you've given thought to what distinguishes you, if there are, you know, if you've identified any specific traits or qualities or strategies that separate you from your peers. And I'm, I'm the least self-analytical guy. Like I, I, ne I never even look back at my old stuff, you know, so it's, it's always quite hard to judge. And I never really sort of look at myself, you know, like, I don't know, there's so much going on around, I can never, have the time to indulge. I mean, I, I kind of like the idea of it, you know, but like, uh, but I, I never actually take the time to actually think, okay, what did I do right? You know, that, that kind of thing, you know, but if I, but I do hear other people make interesting observations, you know, so I, I'm always too busy. There's the kids, there's work, or, you know, all the sort of real life stuff and everything, but you do find other people chatting about you, which is quite weird, you know, and that you see online or sometimes in meetings. And I remember a studio head said to me, the one thing that works very well with my stuff is you know what's going on in the story, which sounds crazy, right? But he says he gets so many comments that float across their desk and he's no idea what's going on. He hasn't a clue. Like it's, you know, part 17 of a 36 part crossover. There's maybe one cool shot in it or something like that, you know, but what, what the hell is this even about, you know? And it sounds crazy, but I mean, maybe it's as simple as that, that you kind of know what my stories are about. Like Wolverine is about, Wolverine hasn't popped his claws for years. He comes back for one last mission. You know, like uh, Kick-Ass, imagine a kid who loved superheroes so much in real life, he tried to be one. And what happens next, you know? So I think it's maybe quite simple ideas. They're quite straightforward. And I think that's what made Stan work and it was what made the Golden Age DC characters work as well. You know, there was nothing too convoluted. It was just very, very straightforward. Um, and I think maybe a bit of fun to them as well, you know, and, and the big thing that makes them work as movies, directors have told me, is that there's a lot of good scenes. So, like, there's a lot of moments, like uh, Stanley Kubrick says a good movie has got eight moments that you can talk about afterwards. And if it's got more, fantastic. But if you've got eight moments, you've got a really good movie. And I don't do it counting it like that, but I do notice a, a graphic novel, for example, you know, like a six part graphic novel, it's probably got a good 10, 12 really good scenes in it, you know, that, that, that will translate and tend to translate, you know, whether it's the barroom brawl in Kingsman or something like this, you know, or, uh, you, you know, any, any one of these things, you know, like, uh, I'll try and do at least every issue of a comic, four scenes per issue, two of them quite memorable ones. And sometimes you can go a wee bit over the top, but that's your job. I mean, it's comics, it's crazy, you know, like nobody looks like Jack Kirby characters. But what made them cool is that they looked, you know, they, they looked awesome. So I'll try and do the same thing with writing. I'll try and come up with the most outrageous scenes that I, I can work, but also try and blend it in the human elements too. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's that's me just like sort of picking what other people have said to me over the years. Um, but I've never, maybe, when I'm an old guy, I think I'll maybe look back and and, and and try and figure out, you know, how it worked. I'm glad it worked. And I know that for the first 10 years it did, which was really weird, you know, like, you only kind of notice people whenever they blow up, you know? I mean, I was writing, you know, those who's who pages you get at the back of DC Comics? I was writing like the text for who's who pages because I remember you got, I think it was $90, $90 for each one of those pages. And I was like, oh, I could really use those $90. And I was like, can, can I write two more of those who's who pages? So, I mean, I was writing everything just to keep my head above the water through my whole twenties. And I was doing things like Swamp Thing, Superman Adventures and everything, but, Nobody was reading these things. I mean, I, I I really worked my ass off, you know, but I was always like 500 copies above cancellation. So like, uh, I remember I used to phone my editors every month and say, are we canceled yet? And they'd be like, no, the sales are still 500 over cancellation. Got another month and I'd be like, oh, 
I can pay my bills, I can keep doing comics, which is all I cared about doing, you know? So then whenever it did blow up for me and things did get really good, but after Authority led the way into Ultimate X-Men, which was a number one book when it launched, which gave me a huge power at Marvel to, to launch at number one. It was amazing, you know? And the fact that Joe had brought me in and Joe was reinventing Marvel at the time, then I got to the Ultimates and then there was Ultimate War came from there. And then Wolverine, uh, Enemy of the State, with John Romita Jr. and everything. So everything I was doing was selling lots of copies, Ultimate Fantastic Four. So they kind of let me crack on and do what I wanted. I was making good dough and everything. Um, but I appreciated it every day and I still do. I mean, I really do honestly remember it so well, the 10, 11 years of nothing happening. Like nobody phoning me, nobody wanting me to really to do anything, just standing around at conventions, hoping to catch the eye of an editor at the bar when somebody else has stopped talking to him and trying to get to know him and tell him my, my idea for this book that he didn't want, you know? And it's still so strong in me, you, you know, that there isn't a day where I don't ever appreciate how lucky I am now, you know? I love that story, the, uh, the, the who's who one-pagers. It always, anytime I hear about this, I always think of Harvey Kurtzman doing like the one pagers in old Marvel comics, like the Hey Looks and stuff, because nobody <laughs> wanted those, you know, like they were, they were, they were the scraps. That was all that he could get, but then he yeah. makes gold out of it. So that's fun. <laughs> when I, when I was a student at the Kubert school, I got a hold of a Mark Miller script that, that somebody brought in, man. And it was, a, it was a part of one of our assignments and I was looking through my portfolio trying to find it to, to dust it off and see if we could revisit it but but i couldn't find it. it was this issue where we had to draw three the first three pages and it's a it's a magician in a church and he puts uh the, oh. the priest goes in the box and then you know abracadabra when the box opens like locusts like swarm <laughs> the church and everything that was one thing 144 it's one thing 144 i always remember it like um, because I was, every one of those issues was like a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. I remember, I, was, I think it was pretty much DC's lowest paid guy, but I was so happy to be getting a monthly check and doing comics because there was so many times in my 20s that I thought it was going to stop. You, you know what it's like, you know, when you're a freelance guy, you're like, what if this, this ends now? And the thing that was funny with that was it was, um, it was actually my first solo published DC Book. I, although I'd sold the Batman script to Archie Goodwin, it lay in a drawer for four years because Archie had bought up so much inventory. It didn't come out for like four years. So that was my first thing that came out. And I remember thinking, I've hit the big time. This is amazing. I'm working at DC Comics. And the industry actually collapsed that month, pretty much that month. Like you had the image guys and everything that, all doing brilliantly. And then 94 came along and the, the industry just completely collapsed. And then it halved again in 95. And it was like an earthquake. We were like, what's that? I was just breaking into the industry as a young 20-something. And the whole thing almost went away. So I was like nervous for 10 years. It was really hard. At a certain point, uh, I have to imagine that you started to, as your, as your name equity builds and you start to sell more books and get, get more recognition, uh, at, what, at one point, do you become like a five-year plan guy who could, who could then begin to design uh, his own career? Um, I... Do you know what? It's funny, actually. I only had a plan to work in comics to do the stuff I loved growing up. It was really interesting, actually, because this was never my plan. My plan was just to do Superman. You know, like, that was the thing I really, really, really loved. And I was a DC guy. Like, it was all to do with distribution. Like, I think whatever bands you're into or whatever movies you're into is basically down to what you were exposed to as a kid. So I was exposed to DC comics. Um, because my, my local stores, you know, just the local grocery stores had lots of DC and they'd know Marvel. There was some Marvel UK stuff, but the Marvel UK stuff quite often was 20 years late. It was like kind of black and white reprints of amazing stuff, like Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko kind of stuff. So I grew up thinking of that as contemporary Marvel in the early 80s. In Scotland, I was reading black and white reprints of Steve Ditko's Spider-Man every, every month, you know. But the DC stuff was really, really easy to come by, I think. There was nine, nine uh, grocery stores in my hometown that used to bring out DC books. So I, I grew up absolutely loving that. And my ambition was just to write Superman, Batman, Justice League, all that kind of stuff. But I just got into the industry for that. And then DC didn't really, I, didn't, I wasn't a good fit at DC. Like I worked in 2008 to get into DC and I thought, okay, I've got the crown. And it was one of those things where I'm in DC, then the industry collapses. And then I looked around and I thought, I don't really like any of the books these guys are doing, you know, like nothing really exciting. I mean, there was some amazing stuff in there, like Mark Wade 
was doing great stuff. He was doing The Flash and Impulse and all that stuff in the 90s. It was great. Kurt Busiek was doing brilliant stuff over at Marvel. But there was a lot of stuff that I just wasn't into. It just didn't feel like me. And I found myself slightly more drawn towards the Vertigo stuff. You know, you, you had some really, really good guys working on Vertigo. And, and I found myself slightly falling out of love with it a little bit. And I, I didn't quite click with the authoritarian nature of the DC Universe editorial. Like I said, you know, there was quite a bullying structure. I think it had come from the people who'd worked at Marvel before that. We were now working at DC and they were, they were pretty authoritarian guys, you know. And uh, I, I just, I didn't quite click with it. Um, so then I thought, well, this is, this is probably not going to happen for me. And I was almost on the way out of the industry in the late 90s. And I sold a television show to Channel 4 in the UK, a vampire TV show. Um, and I'd never considered working in television. I'd only ever wanted to work in comics. And then the authority became available. And, uh, and I ended up going in and, and doing the authority. But it was a total accident. This was never like a genius plan or anything. And then Marvel poached me from there which made it look as if I'd had this fantastic career move, but it was just because the authority was hot. Marvel came in and poached me. One book after another, Marvel did well. And then suddenly I was writing all these huge books. But it was this, I, I was, I, I probably written more Marvel comics than I've read, you know, like I, I was never really a Marvel guy. Um, but I really loved the environment. The environment at Marvel was great. Joe Quesada was not unlike Dick Giordano in the sense he was a boss who had also been a freelancer. So he kind of created this really nice working environment for, for those five or six years. Um, from 2001 to about 2008, when I was doing most of my work there. Um, but it was actually Jimmy Palmiotti said to me um, around about 2002, he said, why are you doing all this uh, stuff for th this work for hire? And I was like, well, it's amazing, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm writing four of the top five books this month, you know? And he was like, that's no big deal. He said, you've, you've got to lay down the mark for your, you know, who you were. You can't just be part of like uh, the Marvel story or the DC story. So you've, you've got to sort of tell your own story. Like at the end of your career, you'll look back and regret it if all you've ever done is company characters. And I was like, oh, I really thought of that. And it had never been an ambition, you know, because I was a fanboy who wanted to do this stuff. And um, and I, I sat down and I thought, I'm going to give it a try. But, you know, I'll try one. And I did want it. And that was the very first one I ever tried. And before the book came out, we'd sold the movie rights. Like Universal had called up and, and asked about the rights. And I thought it was a prank call. It was one of those weird things where you think, yeah, of course. You know, so some guys, hey, I'm calling from Hollywood and I'd like to buy your <laughs> stupid uh, first issue. You know? And it was, so before the, the thing actually came out, we'd sold the movie rights. And I was like, hey, wait a minute, maybe, maybe, maybe Jimmy was right. You know, this is pretty cool, you know? And like, uh, and then, what looked like a series of fantastic career moves was actually a series of just happy accidents like that. So I always did what I wanted to do really, you know, what I just felt would be fun. So for example, when I was doing Ultimates, Ultimates was pretty much Marvel's number one, number two book for the whole five, six years that it ran. And Joe said to me, you should keep doing this. And I was like, I'm done. You know, the story's uh, it's over, you know? And he said to me, the Wolverine stuff went down great, you do more. And I was like, yeah, I've, I've sort of told that story. And I, and I would go off and do something like American Jesus. You know, I'd go and do like a little book that nobody was reading or anything. So I, to answer your question from earlier, which I didn't answer was, I've never followed the cash, weirdly. The cash has luckily come uh, when I'm doing what I want to do. But that was the lesson I learned from the 90s which was if you follow the cash, if you try and find an audience, you won't. But if you do something you personally love and you, you really want to do, that enthusiasm is really contagious. And other people, if you like it, will maybe like the story too. And, uh, and I think that's the most valuable lesson I'd say to any creator, to, to, to go for the thing you want. And I'll give you another example. Whenever I was leaving uh, Marvel, I just, had, um, I just had wanted out as a movie and... Uh, Kick-Ass was in production, but we hadn't sold it. I mean, Kick-Ass is a, a very interesting story that what happened was we, the movie got made privately financed with no studio backing, no studio wanted it. And Matthew Vaughn, the director, went off and made the movie and then sold it to the studio after he'd made a movie they said they didn't want. I mean, it was really bizarre. So I didn't know, I had a huge tax bill at the time, I remember. I had like no cash. And uh, this was maybe 2009, 2000, late 2009. And no idea whether Kickass was even getting picked up by a studio or anything, you know. And Marvel said to me, if you sign up for another three years and come back and do Wolverine and all that kind of stuff, we'll give you a million dollars. And I was like, that's a lot of money, you know. That's, and they were like, yeah, we'll give you a million dollars. We'll send you the check now for a million dollars. And I remember I, I, I had an overdraft and a big tax bill and I had no cash. And I was like, I'm going to go and just do my own stuff. 
And they said, are you crazy? They said, it'll take you six months to get the comic together. Then it'll take you a few months for it to come out. And then you don't get paid with Creator Owned for about another six months, you know, by the time the cash comes back. I said, so you've got a tax bill to pay, you know, because I know the guys really well, you know. And they said, we'll give you this cash now, but you have to sign with us for three months. And I was like, I'm just going to go and do my own, my own stuff. And I would often created all the stuff that eventually became Miller World, but it was a hell of a risk in, in hindsight, you know, and I was borrowing money from the bank sometimes to pay the artists because I would pay the artists, uh, no, not initially, guys like Johnny worked for, for, um, for free up front and then got the money on the back end, but a lot of the artists couldn't afford to take a year off to come and do a Miller World project. So I would have to match their Marvel rates and give them that money up front and then get that money back later, you know? So it was a crazy time, you know, and, and it was very tempting, you know, when somebody puts a check down for that kind of money, you're like, uh, you know, you're inclined to say yes. But like I say, I've always stupidly just felt it will all be okay and I'll just do what I love and then everything will be fine. Mark, I wanted to ask you about the artist relationship in terms of uh, creator ownership. And mm -hmm. everything you've been talking about segs really nicely into this topic. Um, the fact that you weren't, you know, thinking in terms of creator ownership when you first get into this game, you know, I wasn't sure if that was something you discovered in the 80s when you're reading Alan Moore essays, you know, and planting yeah. those seeds. But if I understand right, you have a 50-50 split with all of your artists uh, in terms of ownership? Yeah. I, I think it's commendable. I, I mean, I certainly know writers who do creator ownership and work out especially I'll pay in advance deals where they keep that ownership themselves. So it's not right. a given that, that uh, this yeah. kind of relationship is 50, 50. So I commend you for that. I, I, that's the best. Can you talk about what motivated that? I'm sure you, you know, you could have done this a, several different ways. I think it's just common decency, you know, like I, I think like an artist will spend more time on, on the project than you will, you know, so, so there's, there's that, you know, so the idea of making less money, just seems ridiculous, you know. So um, the whole thing at Mellow World, uh, the whole from 2003 when I started it up until 2017 when we sold it, the deal was very, very simple. You would eventually, if you had the money, you know, you would be paid at least your Marvel or DC page rate, a thousand dollars a page or whatever. You know, you'd, you'd be paid your Marvel and DC rate, um, and you would have a 50% stake in the property if anything happened with it, like merchandise, because we'd kick ass merchandise. We had kick-ass Pez dispensers and everything. So like anything like that, if I, if I make 50 cents, you make 50 cents. I and mean, that's what I said to everybody. And it's funny, people said to me, maybe, why don't you do it like 55, 45 or something like that, you know? And I was like, but then people get a bit funny, you know, like, but 50, 50, everybody's happy with, no matter how cranky somebody is, 50, 50, nobody can really complain about it, you know? So my relationship with all the artists is all great, you know, because I, I've always said that. And the one thing I did do, which was eventually quite a lot of dope, was I said to the guys, I'll also have my executive producer rate with you as well, you know. Um, so on one since I was given a token executive producer uh, thing, and so was JG as well, JG Jones. Um, but by the time I was on Kickass, I was properly producing, you know, so I was on set, I was reading all the scripts, I was watching the editions, I was doing all this stuff. And I said to the guys, I'll half my producer fees as well. So I mean, it, was, it ended up being quite a chunk of money. And this is this was the same for everything, because anytime we sold something like Starlight to Fox or Nemesis to Warner Brothers and everything, we would um, we would my producer fee was quite substantial, as well as the the rents, and I would always half it with the artist as well. And then when we sold the company, um, some people said to me, "Are you still going to half this with the artist?" And I was like, "Yes, we we co-own." We co-own this stuff, you know? So whenever we, we sold the company to Netflix, um, part of the deal was part of the deal was for me to stay on and work in-house as an executive at Netflix and create new material in-house, um, new IP, um, which is a different thing. But like, uh, but the actual deal of selling Miller World to Netflix, um, right down the middle, you know, we just did a, an absolute 50-50 and all the artists were delighted. I mean, I think in some ways I kind of ruined the comics industry and I worried I kind of ruined the comics industry because so many people have taken time off. You it's, know, like, it's been ruined uh, several times. <laughs> I don't think you can credit yourself for that. Well, well you know what? I, I am super glad to get these these two pieces on, on the record about Netflix and, and uh, the, the deals as a writer with the artists because uh, a lot of the problems that I have with the comics that I see on the racks uh, are very clear, like Netflix, Netflix pitch comics that uh, they look at, I, this is conjecture, this is me talking, uh, they 
could almost give a crap about the medium of comics and they're just trying to like use my beloved medium that I freaking love and adore to try to advance themselves in this film game. And then yeah. also there's so many poor man's Stan Lee type characters out there who write five books, you know, they, they uh, pay a page rate or something man, and just, uh, you know, throw things at the wall, see what sticks and, uh, you know, generate royalties off of all that stuff when they have minions just drawn in, in their little hole. Yeah, I, I don't take uh, human decency for, for granted in this kind of thing because comics history is just, it's it's written, you know, in indecency, I guess, for lack of a better term. But I mean, it's it's very rare to have that kind of equal split historically, so. I think that's some American shit probably, man. It might be. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> I think it's interesting though because I, I kind of do the opposite of the Netflix pitch comics. And as people usually always say to me, oh yeah, you, are you just doing this stuff to sell it as a movie? And I was like, I would just sell it as a movie if I wanted to sell it as a movie and I'd keep all the money, you know? I love comics. I, I don't want to be a screenwriter. So what I, what I do now, weirdly, is the complete opposite. And what I do is I work in-house at Netflix and I create an IP and the IP will be a television show or a, or a movie. And probably a half to three quarters of what I'm creating in-house I'm bringing out as a comic later, but it's owned by Netflix. So the deal is a completely different thing now. You know, it's not like when I had Miller World, you know? So Magic Order was the first one of these. There's Magic Order, Sharky, um, Space Bandits, and then some of the new ones that's coming up, Prodigy as well, and some of the new ones that's coming up. That what happens is they'll be created as movies or television shows. And then a team of designers will work with me on the look of the characters and the production bible starts to get put together. And then I'll say to the guys, like, I really want to do a comic of this as well. And they will be like, could you not just work on another TV show or something? I'll be like, I, I, I really, I love doing comics. Can you give me some time out that I can go to this comic? And they're like, cool. So I go away and I, they say to me, Look, if you're going to do a comic, I want the best artist in the world. And I was like, okay, give me a gigantic page rate and I'll go and get Olivia Coypel. So I'll go away and I get Olivia to draw the Magic Order, but he's working from a production rival kind of thing. So it's interesting that all the ones since the Netflix sale, it's kind of the opposite, where it starts as a TV show or a movie. And then, not that it's adapted as a comic, but it's, it's, it's a separate thing, you know? So it's, it's created as a, another entity. But because I love comics so much, I mean, Netflix are not comic publishers, but I said to them whenever I signed my deal, I said, I can't disappear for 10 years and just work in-house at Netflix and not have a presence in comics. I love comics. So I didn't see comics as a stepping stone to work in film and television. And I said, and when I was cutting my deal for, for this job, I said, will you let me do a certain amount of comics every year and give me crazy page rates to get the best apps in the world? And they were like, yeah, okay. And it's, it's perfect, you know, it's great. And it's quite bulletproof with the comic book recession and everything, you know, which is, which is great because the artists are getting the most phenomenal rates. And whenever the TV shows are out, these books are going to sell gangbusters and trades, so the artists are going to make a lot of royalties. Because I'm on staff, actually, I won't make any royalties, which is crazy, you know. But like, uh, but I don't care, you know. I mean, I, I just love, I love doing comics. And the idea of ten years not doing them would be unthinkable. Mark, can you talk about the strengths of comics uh, compared to TV and movies? Um, there's the very obvious thing, which is budget. You know, like the the Jupiter's Legacy TV show is expensive. It's a hundred million. You know, you've you've got over 10 million an episode. Um, but there has to be some conversations in it, you know, so that it's not super expensive all the time. It can't be 30 million an episode. It has to be around 10 million an episode. Whereas comics doesn't have those limitations. I mean, if you're doing a soap opera, it's all dialogue. You know, you, you don't have any spaceships crashing into the Empire State Building or anything because uh, you can't afford to do that stuff. But what's beautiful about comics is that a conversation costs the same to draw as the most outrageous Warren Ellis kind of authority planetary type, type big scale stuff. And I love that about comics, the fact that your imagination is the only limitation. Whatever you can come up with, it's fine, just do it. And, and it's also a bit of a pirate medium as well, you know, like Netflix is good. Uh, I've got to say Netflix has never given me any grief. They're, they're really great to work for. Um, but I've heard at studios, you know, sort of people going to my notes and saying you can't do this, you can't do that, you know. Um, which is a consideration in comics. I think comics is like a pirate medium. You can just go off and do anything you want. And even if you're doing something huge, you know, like Superman or Batman or X-Men or something, you can get in stuff that you'd be surprised at, you know? Like, uh, you, can, you can pretty much write about what you want, which is lovely. Um, so I think the fact nobody's watching 
comics is great. There's no legal teams looking at it and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's what I love about it. I love the idea of it being something that you're slightly, it's a bit dangerous and it's kept under your bed. And your mum would rather you didn't read them when you were a kid, but it's cool that you do. Like Howard Chaykin, I mean, my God, Howard Chaykin was the first time I was ashamed to have a comic in the house when I was maybe 12 or 13. Yeah, you had uh, black kiss too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, American Flag, I got American Flag issue one. And I don't know, I think I got it really cheap actually, because I could never, normally not afford that many books. And when I was that age, I would only buy books that had Superman on them. So I was buying maybe five comics a month. And, uh, and I think I saw American Flag for 10p, you know, like about 15 cents. And that's a junk store kind of thing, you know, uh, issue one. And I read it and it was like the adult world opening up in front of me, you know. And I instantly fell in love with Howard. I mean, Howard just became an idol to me then. Like he's up there in my Mount Rushmore with Alan Moore and Frank Miller. You know, I absolutely love Howard, you know. But I remember actually my mum, if she found something like American Flag, she would be horrified and probably make me throw out all my comics. So I had to kind of hide it and I had it some DC Presents or some Brave and the Bold or something like that, you know. And, and there's something quite exciting about that, you know, and I think comics is the last place kind of like this. Mark, are all of your uh, creative uh, ambitions uh, collaborative? Like, is there, a, is there a novel in the works, something that you want to have complete 100% agency over? Well, what's better than comics, you know? Like, I mean, I, I think, like, comics is one of those lovely things when one plus one equals three. You know, like me plus Frank Quietly is so much more interesting than me. You know, so so I I, I really I, I love the idea of working with the best artists who bring things out in my stories that I didn't even know were in there. That was me uh, in a roundabout way trying to see if you have some uh, single man comics coming out uh, <laughs> at some point, man. Mark, another piece that I think of when I think of you is. I don't know if brand conscious is the right way to say this, but, you know, when Miller World was announced a decade ago or something, it made big waves, just the announcement. You know, you seemed very good at publicity, uh, selling your work, something that a lot of cartoonists are notoriously poor at. Um, yeah. Does that come naturally? Are you working with somebody, you know, at that stage to put this stuff together? No, no, it was, it was literally just me making up crazy ideas, you know, like, like I've always thought, if you're into something, don't be shy about it. You know, if you're, if you're enjoying it, um, you know, don't hide it under a bushel, you know? Like I've spoken to pals at conventions and they've said to me, oh man, I, I'd be so embarrassed to do what you do, <laughs> you know? And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, are you not ashamed to say this is the greatest comic you've ever read? And I was like, well, I'm not going to say it's the fifth greatest comic you've ever read, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, you've got to advertise it as like, you've got to make somebody part of their 299 as it was back then, you know? And, uh, and I, uh, I, I've never seen the point in underselling, you know? I mean, ultimately it is a business, you know? And you, you want people to check out your book. There's no creative person in the world doesn't want as wide an audience as possible. Anyone who says they don't is lying, you know. Otherwise, you would not let it leave the house. You would put these things under your bed, you know. So everybody wants an audience. Um, so I, I really find it fun. Like, uh, I remember for, um, for Kick-Ass, I got friends to make a viral video with me of a guy dressing up as a superhero and go. And this is back when viral videos were kind of new-ish, you know. So I got a guy dressed up as a superhero going into a park and taking on some muggers who were beating up a guy. And it's the scene from Kick-Ass issue two, um, and, which they used in the movie as well. And I, and I got a, a friend to put it up on YouTube so it wasn't connected with me or anything. And then on the Miller World website, I said, hey, check this out. There's a guy trying to be a superhero. And this, it actually got a lot of views. It got tons of views and it ended up, so back in the day when there was not that much to see in the world of the comics, like, Tim Story was doing a Fantastic Four movie or something like that. Was, there wasn't that much exciting stuff going on. And, uh, and it kind of went everywhere for a little bit. And then I said, oh, this character Kick-Ass, this guy's claiming to be here's a comic book about, you know? So I would do little fun things like that, you know, to kind of try and get people interested. I, I mean, one of the daft ones, I got a pal to Photoshop a picture of Superior issue one into Barack Obama's hands while he's walking onto Air Force One. And he's got regular papers and he's got Superior issue one. And it kind of went everywhere for, for about 12 hours, you know? And then people realized, I mean, now people would fall for this stuff, but back in 2009, 2010, people kind of fell for this. And uh, one of my favorite ones was uh, I said, look, I've got some money from the Wanted movie and I'm going to put it all into advertising my new book. And everybody said, what are you going to do? And I said, you'll find out tomorrow. Anyone passing Times Square is in for a big surprise. And I got a friend to Photoshop 
the cover of Nemesis issue one and put it up on a billboard in Times Square, right? Just a Photoshop, right? And, uh, and we put it up online and people were like, oh my God, this must have cost millions of dollars, you know? And it kind of went everywhere for like five hours. And then by the time America kind of woke up and people were sort of heading to work in New York, guys were taking pictures of it and debunking it. But what that did was it bought me a second wave of stories five hours later. So people were just talking about it all day and then when the book came out, we sold tons of copies. It was great. Now, I just, I love that stuff. I find it really fun. So, I mean, my God, I've never used an agency. I, it was really just me and my pals sitting having a beer coming up with crazy plans. That's kayfabe, man. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's awesome. Did you ever try this kind of marketing when you were at Marvel or DC? And if so, how did they respond? Were they on board? Are you behind the century? Remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> well, the, the uh, Marvel, there was a little bit of that stuff going on. There was a little bit. I mean, the good thing about Marvel actually was the Ultimate line was really exciting in itself because Marvel sales had sort of been going down in the late 90s. It's, uh, the other side of 95, Marvel was struggling and they were going through a lot of um, sackings and everything. You know, things were pretty tough at Marvel. And it got to the point, obviously, they were almost filing for Chapter 11. It was terrible and... Nobody, they couldn't afford to have a coffee machine anymore in the in the office. It was absolutely crazy. And there was rumors of checks getting bounced and everything. So Bill James coming in with Joe Casada and coming up with the ultimate line was really, really exciting. So there was and we were getting into Walmarts and all that kind of stuff. So you almost didn't need to do much with that. Like it was kind of all done for you. Like here's a new Spider-Man, here's the new Avengers, here's the new X-Men. Like that was exciting enough that retailers were like, okay, we're in. This is good. Like, here's a couple of quite hot writers, super hot artists, and the greatest characters of all time getting a, a facelift. That was enough to sell it, you know? But as time goes on, and especially as you're doing your own stuff, you have to be a little more creative. I used to try a little bit of DC, but like I said, I used to bump heads a lot with the DC guys because they were very corporate and they would be terrified of anything like this. I can't remember the ones I did, but I did pull a few fun stunts at DC and like, um, and I would be hauled in front of someone over the phone because I was, <laughs> so it was, never, it was never too scary because it was only over the phone, but I'd have guys really shouting at me, and everything, you know, telling me not to do this kind of stuff. So what I used to do with the DC guys instead is I used to prank them under false emails. Like, I, and I built up a library of pranks that I did on the DC guys because it was a bit like school, you know, when you've got really strict teachers, the kids love to play a, a prank on the teacher. So it kind of became like that at DC where I, I think I did about 20 different pranks, really elaborate stuff, but I pretend to be a Rolling Stone journalist that I pretend to be a music guy or something like this, you know, getting in touch with DC. I pretended to be from Italian Vogue, offering a modeling shoot to editors and everything, just all, just all this kind of stuff. And I built up a library of pranks and that was the only thing that kept me going through my DC. <laughs> Mark Miller, why are you trying to sell books? God damn it. <laughs> what can the guy possibly say, man? But also like, just speak it to like, it sort of goes along with the the people who do the Netflix pitch comics, man. If you bring somebody from like the outside world to a certain kind of person in comics, they will bend over and take whatever you fucking give them, man. You know, like that's probably the easiest prank. Like we're probably, we might have to bleep this part of the conversation, <laughs> man, because, you know, editors will freaking lick balls to have, you know, some Rolling Stone editor in, 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 talking to them. Well, I mean, I did so many, I pretended to be celebrities because it was back in the day that if an email came in, you believed it, just the name. So if it was like Tom Hanks at Hotmail.com, you were like, oh my God, it's Tom Hanks. <laughs> People used to believe this stuff in the late 90s, you know? And my, my friend, did you ever hear about the prank I played on Bendis when I went to Marvel early on at Marvel? Please tell us. Oh my God, it's amazing. Right. This was one of the last of these pranks. And the, Anybody I was pals with when I was at Marvel, I used to um, do this stuff with. But Bendis, I, I had an absolute beauty. And I pretended to be David Mamet. And David <laughs> Mamet his favorite writer, right? <laughs> and Joe, Joe had told us that, um, Joe Casada said that David Mamet was like a huge comic fan. He was actually really into Silver Surfer, right? That was like his favorite thing. And I was actually really interesting. And then I thought, right, I could do something with this, right? So what I did was I started a Hotmail account, like David Mamet 1949 or something at Hotmail.com. And I contacted Bendis out of the blue. And I said, hey, Brian, I hope you don't mind me contacting me out of the blue. My name's David Mamet. I'm a playwright. Da, da, da. <laughs> Humble. And then said, like, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your stuff. And Bendis had heard the Silver Surfer David Mamet thing as well. So I knew you would think this is real, you know. 
So I said, I'm a huge, huge fan of your stuff. And uh, I hope you don't think this is too much, but I wonder if we could maybe collaborate with Project together. <laughs> and within about one second, an email came back from Bendis saying, oh my God, oh. you're my absolute favorite writer. I heard you this from This is the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me, you know? And I said, this is awesome. You know, so I wrote back and I said, like, I, I can't believe it. You know, this is a marriage made in heaven because I love you too. And, and, and I said, like, uh, why don't we do Spider-Man together? And he was like, I'm writing Spider-Man. This is perfect. You know? So I wrote back and I said, well, do you want to hear some of my ideas for Spider-Man? And he was saying, David Mamet, Spidey ideas, of course. You know? So like, uh, I wrote this thing and it was uh, Space Spider-Man, where Spider-Man has adventures in space. Cave Spider-Man. Like, <laughs> absolute garbage, right? Like, absolute garbage. And, like, <laughs> and, uh, and Bendis is trying to be nice, right? And he's come back and said, well, you know, some of this stuff, you know, is, I, I don't know how, how it would fly, you know. And I said, no, no, it's cool, because I know there was the clone saga, and we could actually create four clones of Spider-Man, have one in space, one back in prehistoric things. Like that. And then he said, well, I don't know, like, what, why don't I pitch some ideas at you? And then I came back and said, do you think my ideas aren't good enough for you? And, <laughs> and then they said, uh, no, no, not at all, you know. And, <laughs> and, and I, I absolutely had him on the hook. It was fantastic. And then I said, listen, if you're not going to write these stories, I'm going to go to a real writer. I'm going to try Mark Miller. <laughs> and then it was me, and he just he replied, just fuck you, Miller, fucking capital. <laughs> this is the first time on Kayfabe where my face hurts, man. Yeah, that's smiling great. too much, man. He, you catfished him in uh, modern day parlance. You fucking catfished Brian Bendis. <laughs> that's awesome. <clears throat> um. Mark, I'm curious about your uh, what, what you see in the near future in comics. We're in a, a weird moment in time in comics. You've been through a couple comic recessions. You talked about ruining comics. What, uh, what do you see in the near future for comics? I think it's a fascinating time. Like, I'm obsessed with trends, right? I mean, the thing about comic guys is we're very comics literate. You know, so we, we, we look at the past and we can see the future from the past, you know? And I noticed when I was a teenager... I was reading an interview with uh, Denny O'Neill and it was around about the time the first Batman movie was coming out, you know, the uh, Michael Keaton Batman movie. And Denny O'Neill said, uh, you know, somebody asked him, did you ever think we would be in this position? You know, like uh, there's a, a Batman movie coming out, you know, in cinemas. And he said, 10 years ago, I didn't think there was going to be an industry. He said, I came in in the 60s when it was doing really well. He says, and in the 70s, it just completely collapsed. And here we are now, late 80s, the comics are doing fantastic. And as a teenager, I thought, that's interesting. Because that's what made me realize it's not always the same. And like politics, things move in cycles. So you roughly get you know, eight years of a Democratic president, roughly followed by eight years of a Republican president. You know, politics tends to move like a sine wave as well, it tends to go in cycles. And there's a few outliers, but generally, you know, it swings left and right. In comics, it's the same. I, I've noticed that there's a very successful decade, like the 40s followed by a lean decade like the 50s, followed by a very big thing like the 60s, followed by a creatively fascinating but sales-wise very poor 70s where everything was in turmoil. Marvel Comics, I think, were down to 16 pages. The rest was ads, you know? Followed by the 80s, which is a golden age, the collapse of the 90s, a rejig in the 2000s. And I think it's been quite a fallow decade, you know? Like, there's been a lot of stunts over the last 10 years to boost sales, you know, like 60, 80% discounts to stores and everything. But if you look at the overall numbers, certainly in the last five years, it's been weak. And, and there's certainly, there's much less excitement about comics overall, not to discredit what some people are doing because there's some amazing comics out there, but just as the industry as a whole, we know footfall in comic stores is less than it was. So I'm convinced though, I've always said, that 2020 is the beginning of the rebirth of comics. And I know that's a weird thing to say right now in the middle of COVID and you know a global pandemic multiplied by a recession, multiplied by Marvel fatigue, you know, coming from the movies and everything, you know. But I, I am utterly convinced that towards the end of this year, we have the beginning of a rebirth of comics and we're going to get into the best decades we've ever had as creators. So it's, it sounds odd, but I, I actually see good times ahead. I, I think in the short term, there's bad times. I think that it's inevitable. Half of the half of the comic stores out there um, were dangling by a thread already. Like a lot of my friends are retailers, and they didn't get into this for the money. They get into it because they loved it, and they just 
were making a living are just keeping their head above the water. But um, something like this, you know, a third of these stores might not reopen or a quarter of these stores might not reopen at the end of this. That is going to have not an instant impact that you're going to see sales on books accordingly going down a certain percentage as well. And then you have a contagion effect that will probably happen towards the end of the year because the stores that were just managing to keep their head above the water after COVID are going to be not having as many books on, on the market that they used to sell and so on. So I mean, like every recession, it's going to have a multiplier effect. But I do think that what will come from this is ingenuity, you know, and it's going to be really hard. And I've got so many friends in retail and so many friends who are creators I'm really worried about. Um, I mean, I'm very, very lucky to be on a salary. You know, I work at, at Netflix, but a lot of my friends who, who you know, are working at Marvel in DC, it's check to check. I work like that for most of my career. Um, and that, that's going to be a scary time. But I do think the interesting thing about comic people is they tend to be pretty smart and they tend to be pretty ingenious. And all we need is a pen and paper. I mean, you cannot stop us. You know, you could throw us in a jail and we will still manage to do comic books, but we'll get a pen off somebody and we'll get a paper off somebody and we'll still do comics, you know? So I think that no matter how bad this year gets, and I do think it's going to be really hard, I think that something good will spring up out of it. And I'm not entirely sure what it is, whether it's a revolution in digital or whatever, you know, if it becomes something a bit more like music where you have speciality stores like vinyl stores, you know, where you get maybe digital, digital monthlies and then you get very expensive collector's edition uh, comic store stuff. I don't know. I mean, somebody smarter than me, I think, will figure this out. But every 20 years, somebody comes along and does it. And, and I think it will be on the back of younger creators coming in too, because I think that's what's really missing. Just now, you know, that historically, you tend to have every 20 years some new talent comes in and it lifts all ships. So back in 2000s, Bendis and I were like two unlikely guys, you know, but came in and sold loads of books at Marvel, you know. 20 years before that, you had Frank Miller, Alan Moore, Marv Wolf and those guys, you know, in, in 1980. Uh, 20 years before that, it was Stanley and Jack Kirby. 20 years before that, it was Siegel and Schuster and uh, Gardner Fox and all the Golden Age guys. Um, so, so roughly every 20 years, there's new people come in with a really, really exciting new take that then pulls the industry up for a decade and then you have a gentle decline. And I've noticed that it tends to also follow, you usually get about five good years at Marvel, where there's creatively I'm talking about, five good years at DC, five good years of new characters, then five years of flux. And I think we're just coming out of the five years of flux, you know? So I think that two, 2001 to 2006, broadly Marvel were top dog. 2006 to 2012, DC were ruling. You know, they were doing some great stuff, their all-star line and everything. Marvel seemed to fall by the wayside a little. Then Image, I think, had a great five years. There was Saga and all those books coming out, you know. But I think the last four, four years or so, I don't think there's been any massive seismic books. There's been nothing that's pulling people into stores the way that you had Saga or Civil War or Walking Dead, all this kind of stuff. There's nothing new that's really appeared in that time. But I do think there's probably people who are about 28 to 30 right now who are like, why are there guys at 50 writing these books? You know, like these guys must die. You know, so like, so like my, my, my generation of guys should be sort of moved on. You know, we'll still be working in comics, but we shouldn't be at the forefront of it, you know, and there should be some 20 somethings coming through doing stuff that we can't possibly get our heads around. And it's going to be so exciting because as a fan, I feel I really need to see that right now. And that's, that, that's why I see the next couple of years. Mark, are you conscious of books like uh, Raina Telgemeier's Smile or um, Dog Boy? These are all ages books that are coming out of, you know, like a more traditional book publishing model and distribution system, but selling millions of copies of books, you know, into libraries and into this, what I'm very hopeful is a new generation of readers. But mm -hmm. is that something that you're conscious of as, as a reader, as a comics person? <laughs> As a guy standing in public transport and everything, I see it, which is interesting, like Dog Boy. I remember seeing like this tiny little kid who was about five or something, you know, barely able to read, sitting reading Dog Boy. Uh, I was in a line at uh, an airport waiting for to get boarded, and I saw this kid sitting reading it. And then when I went on the plane, I saw a girl who was about 19 sitting reading Dog Boy, and I was like, what the hell is this? This was years back. And I Googled it, and I was fascinated because that's what I'm talking about, you know, stuff that's not on my radar, you know, that we... When we're creators, we, I think we extrapolate what we grew up with 
Um, so for, for me, I grew up with the 80s comics, you know, so then when I got to sit in the throne in the, the 2000s, everything was a homage to Alan Moore and Frank Miller and all the stuff I grew up with in the 80s, you know. But the influences for this current generation will be people who were born in the 1990s, really, you know. So Dog Boy makes absolute perfect sense. Those guys in a way that it maybe wouldn't connect with me. Like my oldest daughter, you know, she grew up in the time of Pokemon, you know. Like Pokemon was, as a toddler, she adored Pokemon. So when she draws, there's a slight Pokemon edge to her artwork and everything, you know. And I, my, my influences are Kurt Swan and Jack Kirby and Steve Dicker, you know. So, but that's the way pop culture should be, you know. It should always be something new coming through. And we write about, we write and draw everything we loved as kids once we get a chance to be the adult doing that stuff. So the people who grew up in 90s TV shows and everything, they, these guys are just coming into their own now. And I, I, I cannot wait to see what they do. I mean, imagine somebody like that coming in and revolutionizing Marvel. You know, like Marvel's been, you know, it's, it's, it's ruled in terms of um, pop culture for the last 10 years, but they've played it safe. You know, like uh, there's, there's nothing experimental going on at Marvel since Disney bought them. You know, um, and I remember at the time the email going out to all the freelancers saying, great news, Disney's bought Marvel. And I was like, oh, to me, it felt like, you know, an independence day when you saw the ship coming over New York, you know, and I was like, this isn't great news. You know, this is good. we're being sold, this is great news, but ultimately this means Spider-Man is going to become Mickey Mouse, you know. But, but I do, I would love to see people coming in who are radical and completely shaking up Marvel and DC from a writer and artist point of view. We're coming up to uh, the the end of our time here. Uh, I don't want to leave the conversation without without thanking uh, Brendan McCarthy for connecting us to even make this possible. But Mark, when when you and I were, we were uh, uh, in correspondence uh, by way of email to set this this whole thing up, um, it's clear that you listen to the interviews that that we post up there. But you also kind of like gave me a little illustration of like what your work day is like, beginning at like eight eight a.m going through lunch, working through dinner or eating dinner super late, but you, you put in like a solid, you know, 10, 11 hours a day or something, at, at least it seems. Uh, how, how do you even have time to listen to this stuff as a writer? Can you have things playing in your mind, like like in your ears while you're, while you're writing? I just, just spend less time with the people in my life who really matter. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I mean, in all honesty, like, um, if you're writing, you cannot hear dialogue. You just can't, you know? And I'm so jealous of my artist pals because they have the radio on and they have CDs on and things, and they'll just sit and draw and listen away, you know? And I would love that. There are podcasts. I mean, it, it'd be lovely to just listen to podcasts all day, but I can't. So what I do is I, at the end of my working day, my little one-hour treat to myself, or in the case of you guys, 90 minutes, 120 minutes sometimes, is I just treat my... My, my wife thinks I'm still working because I'm at the other end of the house and she can't see so, like, so I, I'm going to say oh, I was working really hard, but I'll listen to you guys for like 90 minutes and, and it's my little treat at the end of the day. But it's funny you say, I mean, the way my work day works, I was talking to a pal about this recently, and I said, it is weird because it takes me a couple of hours to get into what I'm doing, you know, like to really get into it. And then it takes a couple of hours to come back to the real world as well. And it sounds so pretentious, right? And I'm almost embarrassed saying it. This is one of the few places we can say it because... You probably feel the same way, you know, but, but one of my pals described it so brilliantly and he said to me, it's, it's like getting high or, or it's like going down a mine. He says that it takes you a little while to get down the mine to go and do your work. You know, you're in that elevator going down the mine and you head off and you do your work and then you have a shower and everything and then you've got to come back up again, you know, to be in the real world. And I think writing and drawing is a bit like that, you know, that you have to completely disassociate yourself from everything, and that takes a couple hours. And then you get maybe five good hours of writing, you know, and then it takes a couple of hours to come back out. And that's when you do your tweet. You'll notice all my tweets at the beginning and the end of the day. And that's you limbering up. That's like your stretching exercises. You're on Facebook a little bit, you're emailing pals and things. But seeing those five hours where you're really going at it, like you can't stop and eat. It's like being in a trance. It really is it's really weird, but you have to give it your full focus. You don't even realize you're hungry. So you, you just, you blast on with it. And if somebody phones you, it'd be a nightmare. It'd be like waking somebody up in the middle of a dream. You've got to actually stay with it. So I switch off the phones. I've got a lock on the door. There's two doors before you get to my office and I lock both doors. It's like a nuclear silo. I lock both doors so the kids can't come and ask me something, you know? 
And I'm like, I'm, I just hope nobody has a heart attack or something like that, you know, because I'm never going to help. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm off doing my common stuff in here, you know. And then when I come back out, I'm depressurized, you know, and I'm ready for the real world again. And I come out and I have dinner with the family and everything. And then I put the kids to bed, fall asleep, and then it all starts over again. Everything you just said is uh, amplified about five to 10 times just from this conversation. And I don't know when I'm going to come down from this. Like, I'm so excited to get back to the drawing board and just put in some freaking hours, man. Jimmy, do you have anything or, or can we uh, can we wrap things up? Yeah, we can wrap things up. Uh, what a great conversation. Thank you very much, Mark. It's It's been a pleasure talking with you. No, I mean, can I just say to you guys, I know how Jacob said something similar, you know, that, that little intro at the start of it. But what I love about this is that I, I didn't realize how much I was missing this until I found you two. <laughs> and it was, it was Brendan about six weeks ago, dropped me a line and he said, have you seen these guys? I was like, no, no, what's this? He said, check this out. You're going to love this. And, uh, and, I, and I, I spent like four hours. I just was going through everything. And I, I was reading like analysis of issues of Wizard and things like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was loving it and I realized I think especially guys like me or Frank Miller or whatever, you know, the guys who kind of work in a couple of industries, you know, we tend to talk mainstream all the time to the point where I think we actually circumnavigate our language so that mainstream journalists understand what we're talking about. So I do find myself even without thinking about it. Whenever I reference a comic, I give it context and explain what that is and when it came out. And there's something so lovely about your own people. You know that when you first discovered a comic store, do you remember what it was like when you first discovered the comic store as a kid? And you're like, this is who I am. You know, like, you're not quite sure. You're not that interested in the stuff. Your friends are into this music. Your other pals are into football. But you're drawing Green Lantern. You know, it's like, it's like you, you don't quite figure out where you fit until you walk into a comic store and you're like, ah, this is my world, you know? And that existed for a long time, especially in the 80s. You had the comics journal, the 90s, you had Wizards and everything. And there was a lot of really good comics journalism. And I hadn't noticed until quite recently how much it was gone. You know, so, I mean, God bless them. You know, the, the, the websites that are out there doing this stuff, they're just trying to survive. So they have to create these clickbait things. But I, I don't even check it out anymore. Like, I used to start my day by checking out the comic websites. I don't even look at them. You know, so it's like 15 things you didn't know about Thanos and 24 <laughs> things you didn't need to know or something like that. You know, like, I, I, don't, I don't need to read that stuff, you know? So... See, actually, that excitement I felt when I saw my first comics journal and it was like a 72-page interview with Will Eisner or something like that. It's like, oh, you know, the, the depth of it. I've really missed it. And it's like it's like I've been eating chocolate for 10 years, you know, and that suddenly there's a nice steak and potatoes and veg. Something that's good for you is there. So, I mean, I don't know how long you guys are planning to do this, but I hope forever because there's so many interesting personalities in comics. There's so many crazies. There's so many lovely people and all that, you know, but they're, they're great for, for interviews, you know, and nobody else is doing it. Robert Rodriguez, I don't know if you guys have seen what he's doing, where he interviews different directors. He does a thing um, on his channel. We don't get it in Scotland, but Robert's a pal of mine and he sends me DVDs of them, right? So he'll interview George Miller for an hour and he'll interview Tarantino for two hours and everything. And it's great because it's a director just talking about being a director to another director, you know. And I always thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a comic version of that? Like comedians in cars getting coffee, but it's two comedians chatting as well. And I always thought, I'd love to go to like, you know, John Romita's studio and sit with him and his dad and just go through his original artwork and all that, you know, and just and just chat for two hours. And it's stuff that only guys like us would really care about. Like don't even think about the mainstream audience. But you guys have saved me the effort. You know, you guys are actually doing it. And I think you're doing it so much better than I would. I, I, I love it. Heck of a compliment, man. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Mark, <laughs> thank you very much. No, at all. And I've noticed, guys, can you actually see me? I've realized it's gone dark outside. <laughs> a silhouette. Can you, can you still see me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We haven't seen your shadow get cast differently. So, uh, like, that's the only faulty piece of the uh, green screen you have behind you <laughs> at that very palatial estate. <laughs> Thanks again, this Mark. Is, this is my wife's office, actually. Like, I'm, I'm doing my office up to look like the DC office of 1958. Are you, like, are you, are you bullshitting or no? No, this is, no, seriously, this is my wife's office. No, no, and no, like, I'm talking about the DC thing. <laughs> oh, DC thing, yeah, yeah. So, like, no, the reason, the very far end of the house is my office, and um, the reception is terrible for Zoom, you know? Like, uh, it's just too far away from 
wherever the modem and everything is, you know. So, so like I, I, uh, I, I come into my wife's office and use her computer for it instead. So, like usually, her, her office is a bit more sophisticated than mine. It looks nice, you know. Whereas I, I've got two offices. One office I've done up to look kind of like Sherlock Holmes' study. So it's like it's a bit like Batman meets Sherlock Holmes, where there's microscopes and vials of chemicals and things like this, you know. And you know, there's a, it's got like a 19, late nineteenth century vibe to it, you know. And then there's my office in the house. And my office in the house, I'm in the middle of doing up to look exactly like a 1958 DC office. It's all teak, mid-century furniture and everything. And it's got a comic rack and everything, you know. And uh, it, it, I think if I ever get dementia and I walk into this room in the future, I'm going to be totally confused. <laughs> other than my computer, everything is from the 50s. Mark, can we do it again sometime in the future? Maybe you could uh, haul in one of the, your long boxes, show off some of the stuff you have, man. But until that day, uh, what you just said is a big fish story, man. So I, I, I need to see some proof of some Sherlock Holmes office work. I need no. to see this DC office. Will I, try and, will I try and take you down to my, my office just now? I could lift the laptop and... Let's do it. Out. Sure. Let's do it, this, man. This suddenly feels like big budget. We're doing a big budget there. <laughs> yeah, this, but this is like, you know, Blair Witch or something, man. So uh, be careful. Like, ah! <laughs> there we go. So like, I think the kids are in bed, so she... And we're just and we're just being quiet because the camera goes on us. So, all right, cool. Put the lights on here. Now the signal will probably get really bad here, so like, uh, let me know if it if it cuts out because it's under the house and away along to one side here. So now remember, this is early days. God, it's freezing down. Now, this is uh, this is an old cellar. This house is three hundred years old. So man we lost him you still here uh yes lost me no we got you are we back yep and we're back yes oh great now, this, this is good this is a corridor that i didn't know we had when we bought the house it was behind a wall so um i'm going to turn it into a big original comic art corridor so like uh all this stuff here i've got olivia coipel this is all from books i've done so we've got like dave gibbons olivia coipel matteo scalera and everything and i'm going to run these all the way down here so like, uh, and it goes away around the corridor. I found an old spooky staircase that I didn't know we had as well. You know, that was behind the wall. That's and this is my office is in here. Hang on. So this is my DC of the fifties kind of look. Hang on. It's got that Mad Men vibe to it. It's, it's early days. I'm just putting it together just now, but like. Uh, Probably in about a month's time, I'll have everything that I want. 50 style clock, spinner rack, all this stuff. So like, uh, that, I may have done it a little too soon, but in a month's time, I'll send you a picture, you know, and you'll, you'll see it all done. But this end of the house is the bit that I, I try and keep the kids away from. This is where I do uh, pretend to do all my work while I'm listening to you guys. Yeah, just <laughs> just just a traversing the, the house will, will keep you skinny. There's that one little corridor that's the Faraday cage. Yes. And I think he'll come back. Yep, he came back. You're back. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, there's just that one little nook that has some, maybe some rebar. Well, there ain't no rebar in a 300-year-old house. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Mark, thanks a lot. Not at all, not at all. And uh, listen, give me a shot anytime. We should do this every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, just real quick before we split, uh, what are you working on at this very moment? Anything that uh, you want to plug, let the people know uh, that's that's out there or whatever? Well, it's interesting. I did, obviously didn't realize all the comic stores were going to be closed, but I plan to take this year out to catch up. So what I was doing was my last book came out in February, American Jesus. And I think the trade of it is actually out this week or next week. But um, I've got nothing coming out till next Easter. I'm doing like um, Jupiter's Legacy, the next volume of Jupiter's Legacy will be coming out after the television show on Netflix. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've written that already and the sequel to The Magic Order with Olivia Coipel, which Olivia is drawing just now. You know? So like um, those things are not out for like a year. This is, this is like the worst pitch ever, isn't it? You know, like normally I'm pretty good at saying, oh yeah, you should buy my new book, it's out now and everything. You've got a year to wait for this stuff. Everybody's going to forget by the time it comes out, but, but I promise it is good. It's really good stuff. 
Well, let's do it again whenever uh, whenever the stuff's out there, Ben. And uh, before we split, the only thing that I would ask is that, uh, you know, you forward the uh, final video that we post to uh, some of your collaborators so that we could inevitably get a heap of uh, Mark Miller stories. Maybe make a whole <laughs> singular video of just those. <laughs> Who else have you guys got coming up soon then? Have you guys been able to talk about it? Yeah, sure. Like, uh, well, I mean, we, we could tell you. You know what? We're going to wrap it up. Boom.